ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय नारायण नमस्कृत नरम चैवा नरोत्तम देवी सरस्वती व्यास तथो जय मुदीये शवता स्वकथा कृष्णा पुण्य श्रवण कीर्तन हृदय तस्थो ह्य भद्राणी विधु नौति सुहसता नष्ट प्रायश भद्रेशु नित्यम भागवत सेवया भगवते उत्तम श्लोके भक्तिर्भवति नैष्ट की हरे कृष्णा सो टुडे विल बी कवरिंग श्रीमद भागवतम सेवेंथ कैंटो चैप्टर फिफ्टीन इंस्ट्रक्शंस फॉर सिविलाइज्ड ह्यूमन बीइंग्स सो लास्ट संडे वी कवर्ड श्रीमद भागवतम सेवेंथ कैंटो चैप्टर फोर्टीन आइडियल फैमिली लाइफ and for grahastha family life is household life which is referred to be in grahastha ashram so we covered two aspects main aspects we covered many aspects among those two main aspects we covered last week was first is ashram is any place where you can make spiritual advancement and specifically in grahastha ashram the second aspect is that there are five activities that are performed first is to invite sanyasi saintly persons and elevated you know vaishnavas at your home and hear from them second is to perform archana you know worship deity worship at home of the supreme personality of godhead and then the third is to make you know to distribute prasad and to make offerings to the forefathers and then the fourth is to ensure that the prasad is distributed bhagavat prasad is distributed to all the living beings in the neighborhood and whoever is hungry no one should go hungry and we covered one of the example where shila prabha discussed it with one of the newly married couple that grahastha should open the door and say is there anyone hungry we have prasad and say it, announce it three times before accepting prasad so of course not just other human beings but also to make make sure that they meet the needs of lower animals like cats and dogs and even ants and then fifth last but not the least is to accept prasad himself or herself so in grahastha ashram one accepts prasad for two purposes for sustenance of their life ears as well as to purify themselves and today devashi narad he continues so he ended the chapter that brahmana visits the home of a householder to purify them and this is where you know he ends chapter 14 and uh, shrimad bhagavatam 7th canto chapter 15 starts where he gives the instructions for civilized human beings and here there are 16 points that we'll be discussing today so let's continue with the recitation of the verse श्री नारद उवाच कर्म निष्ठा द्विज केचित तपो निष्ठा नृपापरे स्वाध्याये अन्ये प्रवचने केचन ज्ञान योग यो श्री नारद उवाच नारद मुनि सेट कर्म निष्ठा अटैच टू रिचुअलिस्टिक सेरेमनीज अकॉर्डिंग टू वन सोशल स्टेटस एज अ ब्राह्मण क्षत्रिय वैश्य और शूद्र द्विजहा द ट्वाइस बॉर्न स्पेशली द ब्राह्मणस केचित सम तपह निष्ठा वेरी मच अटैच टू austerities and penances nirpa o king apare others 
Swadhyaye. In studying Vedic literature, Anye, others, Pravachane, delivering speeches on Vedic literature, Kechana, some, Jnana Yoga Yoho, in culturing knowledge and practicing Bhakti Yoga. Translation by His Divine Grace, Sri Bhaktivedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada. Narad Muni continued, My dear King, some Brahmanas are very much attached to fruitive activities. Some are attached to austerities and penances. And still others study the Vedic literature, whereas some, although very few, cultivate knowledge and practice different yogas, especially Bhakti Yoga. There is no purpose to this verse, so we'll continue with the next verse. Srimad Bhagavatam, 7th Canto, Chapter 15, Verse 2. Jnana Nishthaya Deyani Kavyanya Anantyam Ichhata Deve Chatad Abhave Syad Itarebhyo Yatahrita Jnana Nishthaya To the impersonalist or the transcendentalist desiring to merge into the Supreme. Deyani, to be given in charity. Kavyani, ingredients offered to the forefathers as oblations. Anantyam, liberation from material bondage. Ichata by a person desiring. Daive, the ingredients to be offered to the demigods. Cha, also, Tad Abhave, in the absence of such advanced transcendentalists. Seat, it should be done. Itarebhya to others, namely those addicted to fruitive activities. Yatha Yatha Arhataha Comparatively or with discrimination. Translation by His Divine Grace, Sisi Bhaktivedan Swami Srila Prabhupada. A person desiring liberation for his forefathers or himself should give charity to a brahmana who adheres to impersonal monism, jnana nishtha. In the absence of such an advanced brahman, charity may be given to a brahman addicted to fruitive activities, karma kanda. Purport There are two processes by which to get free from material bondage. One involves Jnana Kanda and Karma Kanda, and the other involves Upasana Kanda. Vaishnavas never want to merge into the existence of the Supreme. Rather, they want to be everlastingly servants of the Lord to render loving service unto Him. In this verse, the words Anantyam Ichata refer to persons who desire to achieve liberation from material bondage and merge into the existence of the Lord. Devotees, however, whose objective is to associate personally with the Lord, have no desire to accept the activities of Karmakand or Jnanakand, for pure devotional service is above both Karmakand and Jnanakand. Anyabhila shita shunyam jnan karmadya anavritam. In pure devotional service, there is not even a pinch of gyan or karma. Consequently, when Vaishnavas distribute charity, they do not need to find a brahmana performing the activities of gyanakand or karmakand. <coughs> the best example in this regard is provided by Advaita Goswami, who after performing the shraddha ceremony for his father, offered charity to Haridas Thakur. 
Although it, is, it was known to everyone that Haridas Thakur was, was not born, was born in a Mohammedan family, not a Brahman family, and was not interested in the activities of Gyanakand or Karmakand. <coughs> Charity, therefore, should be given to the first-class transcendentalist, the devotee, because the Shastras recommend. Muktanam api siddhanam narayana parayanaham sadurlabha prashantatma kotishva pi mahamani O great sage, among many millions who are liberated, and perfect in knowledge of liberation, one may be a devotee of Lord Narayan or Krishna. Such devotees who are fully peaceful are extremely rare. Srimad Bhagavatam 6.14.5 A Vaishnava is in a higher position than a jnani, and therefore Advaita Acharya selected Haridas Thakur to be the person to accept his charity. The Supreme Lord also says, Name bhakta chaturvedi mad bhaktaha swapachaha priyaha tasmay deyam tato grahayam sacha puja yathahya aham. Even though a person is a very learned scholar of the Sanskrit Vedic literatures, he is not accepted as my devotee unless he is pure in devotional service. However, even though a person is born in a family of dog eaters, he is very dear to me. If he is a pure devotee who has no motive to enjoy fruitive activity or mental speculation. Indeed, all respect should be given to him and whatever he offers should be accepted. Such devotees are as worshipable as I am. Hari Bhakti Vilas 10.127 Therefore, even if not born in a Brahman family, a devotee, because of his devotion to the Lord, is above all kinds of Brahmanas, whether they are Karmakandis or Jnanakandis. In this regard, it may be mentioned that Brahmanas in Vindavan, who are Karmakandis and Jnanakandis, sometimes decline to accept invitations to our temple, because our temple is known as the Angreji temple or Angelican temple. But in accordance with the evidence given in the Shastra and the example set by Advaita Acharya, we give prasad to devotees regardless of whether they come from India, Europe or America. It is the conclusion of the Shastra that instead of feeding many Jnanakandi or Karmakandi Brahmanas, it is better to feed a pure Vaishnava regardless of whether he comes regardless of where he comes from. This is also confirmed in Bhagavad Gita 9.30. Api chet surachāro bhajate māmananya bhāk sādhureva sa mantavyaha samyag veva sito hisaha Even if one commits the most abominable actions, if he is engaged in devotional service, he is to be considered saintly because he is properly situated. Thus, it doesn't matter whether a devotee comes from a Brahman family or non-Brahman family. If he is fully devoted to Krishna, he is a sadhu. Hare Krishna. Om Jnana Timurandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guruve Namaha Mukham karoti vachalam pangum langhayate grim yat kripata daham vande shigurum dina taranam. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna. So, here in these two verses itself, there is so much knowledge being imparted by Devashi Narad too. Yudhishthi Maharaj, because Yudhishthi Maharaj, in the beginning of chapter 14, he had asked that question that Grihasthas who are not aware of the goal of life, 
you know, who are mudas actually. He's referring to himself in such a humble way. You know, what should be, what should they do, and how should they continue to lead their lead their family life. And so the response continues to chapter 15. And here Devishi Narad, he is identifying the very first verse, the four types of brahmanas. And now we have to also understand the instructions for civilized human beings. So it is not just for a brahmana, it is for civilized human beings, you know, that this particular instruction applies to. And here there are different types of brahmanas being described. Karmis, you know, yogis who are in the hat yoga, jnanis and bhaktas. And in the second verse, the Shah ceremony is being identified. So that has been addressed as well. So in this chapter, the four types, the different four types of brahmanas are being discussed. The first is, one studying the Vedas and explaining the purpose of the Vedas to others. Such brahmanas are called brahmacharis. So that is, you know, what brahmacharis do. They study Vedas and they explain the purpose of the Vedas to others. Now the brahmanas, very much attached to austerities and retire from family life, are called vanaprasthas. The third kind of brahmanas, the brahmanas interested in different types of yoga, especially bhakti yoga and jnana yoga, are mostly sannyasis. So not all, but mostly they are sannyasis, members of the renounced order of life. And then the fourth kind are the grihasthas. Grihastha brahmanas engage in different types of spiritual activities, especially in offering oblations to their forefathers and giving as charity to other brahmanas, especially to sannyasis. If such a sannyasi is not available, the charity is given to a grihastha brahmana. So the four types of brahmanas are being described here. And dvija, which was referred, and of course in parenthesis, Srila Prabhupada writes especially brahmanas, because the verse in context refers to brahmanas. While dvijas were three different other social classes as well. Means again, two other social classes as well. Brahmanas being one, and then Kshatriya and Vaishyas. And ones who could not go through the samskar ceremonies and could not get to the state of twice born, they would become Shudras as a labor clerks who would serve one of the three social classes. And now we are looking at the Grahasthasham. And in Grahasthasham, it was identified that the Shah ceremonies should be performed. Why that was at the same time given a warning, then one should not look at his opulent position and try to invite many brahmanas. You know, for demigod worship, invite two brahmanas. For uh, Shah ceremony, invite one brahmana. At the maximum, three brahmanas, but should not be more than that. And the best process of Shah ceremony is identified. That for Shah ceremony, you know, the best process is to distribute what? Bhagavad Prasad the remnants of the food that has first been offered to the Lord, Lord Shri Krishna. And then those remnants, the Bhagavad Prasad should be distributed and given in oblations as well as relatives, you know, to the forefathers and relatives. So that's the best process identified. And in this particular chapter, Devashi Narad, you know, he describes the everlasting prosperity formula. In Srimad Bhagavatam, in 7th canto, 15th chapter, verse 5, he says to Yudhishthi Maharaj, Deshe kale cha samprapte munya annam hari devatam Shraddhaya vidhivat patre dhastyam kam dhugakshayam. When one gets the opportunity of a suitable auspicious time and place, one should with love offer food prepared with ghee to the deity of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And then offer the prasad to a suitable person, a Vaishnava or a Brahman. This will cause everlasting prosperity. So if you are looking for everlasting prosperity, 
All you need to do is prepare a nice prasadam, you know, cooked with ghee and grains, and of course, with, you know, in the right mood of love and devotion, that you're offering it to the Lord. And that bhoka, that offering that you have prepared, bhoga should be a first offer to Lord Shri Krishna. And after the offering to Lord Shri Krishna, it turns into prasad. Prasad is mercy. One of the meaning of prasad is mercy. So once Lord's mercy is invoked in that, you know, offering, so it becomes prasad, and then you feed a brahmana. And it is said in this particular chapter that Lord appreciates the food offering through the mouth of a brahmana because in the stomach there is this fire. Right of digestion. Lord Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, I am the fire, fire of digestion. So he accepts and he appreciates that more than the oblations made in the fire sacrifice. So that's also very interesting. When it's again, we, sometimes people are so much oriented into, you know, they are attracted by the ritualistic ceremonies and fire sacrifices without realizing that Lord is more pleased by someone, you know, feeding a Brahmana, a Bhagavad Prasad. So when Bhagavad Prasad is offered to the Brahmanas, you know, Yajyadev is more pleased. Similarly, like uh, people are very much attracted to, you know, worshipping Goddess Lakshmi. While Tulsi Devi, she is just resting at Lord's lotus feet. So Lord Narayan, he is more pleased with Tulsi because Lakshmi being Chanchala, be, being her nature as Chanchala, she actually sometimes even leaves the surface of the law to serve her, means again to give benedictions to her devotees. So similarly, like you have Lakshmi Devi versus Tulsi, the Lord appreciates Tulsi Devi's service more, who is just serving and lie, you know, happy with lying at his lotus feet. Similarly, Lord is more pleased when someone serves Bhagavad Prasad to Brahmanas than to make oblations in the fire sacrifice. Now, fourth aspect today we'll cover is you know, there are five branches of irreligion. So just to kind of like list what other three aspects we covered. We covered different types of the four categories of Brahmanas in different social classes, or in different ashramas, spiritual classes. And then the best process of Shah's ceremony is to distribute Bhagavad Prasad. And then the third one was the formula for everlasting prosperity. That one should serve, you know, Bhagavad Prasad to a Vaishnava, and that will guarantee everlasting prosperity. And now the fourth point Devishi Narad makes to Yudhishthi Maharaj is that there are five branches of irreligion and one should avoid irreligion. And they are, the first one is irreligion, which is Vidharma. And then Paradharma, Abhas, Upadharma and Chaladharma. Now what are these? They are described very elaborately. Irreligion is vidharma, which is, you know, against the religion, directly opposing the religious principles. That is vidharma. Then religious principles introduced by others are called paradharma. Paradharma is someone else is performing and you accept that without realizing that that's not your dharma. Then a new type of religion created by one who is falsely proud and he opposes the principles of the Vedas is called Upadharma. And then the third type is a pretentious religious system manufactured. Oh, an interpretation by one's jugglery of world is called Chaladharma. Chala means cheating. Cheating dharma. And then a pretentious religious system Manufactured by one who willfully neglects the prescribed duties of his order of life is called abhas, which is a dim reflection of false similarity. But if one performs the prescribed duties, now this is very interesting that after describing the five types of irreligions, you know, Devishi Narada is saying, that if one performs the prescribed duties for his particular ashram or varna, Ashram is the spiritual classes, and the Varnas are the four social classes. Why are they not su sufficient to mitigate all material distresses? So again, this aspect comes in as like, even though 
when they are performing, people in their specific varna and ashram, they are performing their duties. Why could they not be satisfied? So why would their mind be constantly disturbed? And what is the best solution for a disturbed mind? Chanting of the holy name. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So mantra is actually a, a combination of two words, man and tra. Man is mind, tra is the one who delivers. So that which delivers the mind, you know, gives it at peace, gives it the full satisfaction and bliss. That's mantra. And Hare Krishna, Maha Mantra, is the Maha Mantra, you know, just like we have Devas, demigods, and then Mahadeva, Lord Shiva. So similarly, you know, it's the topmost mantra. And it's so easy. All you need to do is a combination of three words. And the meaning of Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is, you're saying Hare, which is name of Radharani, Hara. But just like Sita, when love is called Sita, Hara is called Hare. And then you're saying, you know, so she is the energy of the Lord, the internal potency. And then, Lord Shri Krishna. So you're saying, oh, Mother Hare, oh, Lord Shri Krishna, please engage me in your devotional service. That's all. Very simple meaning of the Mahamantra. And when you're asking for devotional service, that is to purify yourself. It's not that the Lord is waiting for our devotional service. Means again, he's being served by millions and millions of Lakshmis in Vakuntha is described. Yet at the same time, for our purification, we should serve the Lord. And in this particular verse, means again, when it's describing that the best process to conquer the mind is Japa, you know, in the purpose, Srila Prabhupada describes very nicely. And also in the previous verse, the very first verse we covered, how different type of yoga systems are there. And now when it comes to religion, people are so much bothered with like, okay, you know, what Vidharma is, what Paradharma is, what Abhas is, what Upadharma is, what Chaladharma is. Srila Prabhupada in the purport makes it very easy. You know, religion is Sarva Dharma Parityajya Ma Mekam Sharanam Vraja. Lord Krishna in Bhagavad Gita 18 chapter verse 66, he says, give up all varieties of religion and you know, surrender to my you know, serve me. Surrender to my lotus feet. Maamekam sharanam vaja. Take my shelter, he is saying. And aham tvam sarvo pape bhyo mokshe shashmi bhashacha. And I will deliver you from all sins. From all those reactions that are waiting you. I will deliver you from all of those. And do not fear. Bhashacha. Do not worry about anything. And that is very satisfying. And... So in Hatha Yoga, Hatha Yoga, the yogis are trying to do different type of yogic activities, which are like uh, pranayam, you know, they have yam niyam, pranayam, they have, uh, you know, uh, samadhi. They finally, the final stage they want to get to is samadhi. And they're doing different type of asanas just to control their senses. So, you know, so your senses are gross elements and you're trying to control your senses. Otherwise, if you don't control the senses, the senses, they go hither and thither. So, you know, they are engaged in sense gratification. And sense gratification, the Shastra is described like you're putting ghee in fire and hoping the fire to, you know, die out. Does the fire die out when you put ghee in it? No. <laughs> you're putting butter and hoping the fire would, you know, die out. It doesn't happen. So the Hatha Yoga is the system that people follow, many yogis, they're Hatha Yogis, and they try to control their senses. And then those who are completely materially exhausted, they say, oh, this is too much work, I don't want to be bothered with it, let me get the higher knowledge. So they become Gyan Yogis. And their purpose is they're materially exhausted, so they want to, they want to merge into Brahman. So those are Gyanis. You know, their concentration is into Brahman, that they want to merge into, this, you know, Brahman. And they are not aware of Parabrahman, who is beyond Brahman. Parabrahman is Lord Krishna, the personality from whose body Brahman, you know, you know, the effulgence comes out. And they are trying to do what? They are trying to control their intelligence. You know, they are trying to win over the intelligence. They are engaging their intelligence in that manner. 
while bhakti yogis, bhakti yogis, bhaktas, the devotees, they are trying to, you know, win over their false ego. They want to give up the false ego by engaging in devotional service. They are not just purifying the senses, they are not just purifying their mind, they are not just purifying their intelligence, but they are actually going, going further to the ultimate step of engaging in devotional service. And that's what Hare Krishna Mahamantra is. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So devotees, you know, they chant this mantra daily basis, you know, 16 rounds minimum, to make sure that they are asking with that love and devotion to serve the Lord and finally get into their constitutional position. And what's the constitutional position of a devotee? You know, Jivera Swarup Hoya Krishnera Nityadas. Jivera is any living entity. You know, Swarup, you know, the very nature, the constitutional position is Krishnera Nityadas, as an eternal servant of Lord Shri Krishna. So they're constantly serving the Lord. They want to have, you know, one on one engagement with the Lord. Now, when you are engaging, there is a process. We covered in previous classes how the process is very important to do anything. Anything you do, there is a process involved. When you get in the car, the car doesn't automatically run. You actually follow a process for it to get started, for it to start moving, and how you reach your destination, there is still a process that you follow. And you do use different combinations of those processes based on the terrain you are in, right? So that's how it goes on. So the process is, you know, when you are chanting, and you are, you know, Atar Shaddha Tatha Sadhu Sangha, so when you have the shraddha, when you have the faith, you associate with people who have similar faith, right? Sadhu Sangha. And you hear from saintly persons, you hear from people who are more advanced than you, and also Shastras. So when you hear from the Vedic literature, about the Vedic literature, about the instructions given by the Lord himself, then that, you know, brings you to a higher level, where you start engaging in, you know, Bhajanakriya, but for Bhajanakriya, uh, there is a step given by Lord Shri Krishna himself. It's in Bhagavad Gita, chapter 4, verse 34, 4.34. Tad vidhi pranipatena pari prashnena sevaya ubdekshyanti taj jnanam jnaninas tattvadarshina. So as per the process, tad vidhi, vidhi is process. Pranipatena pari prashnena sevaya. One should render service. You know, to whom? Prashnaya Sevya. Ubdeshanti taj jnanam jnaninas tattva darshina. To a bona fide spiritual master who can tell you about the truth, who can show you the truth because he has seen it. Right? So if you have seen something, if you know something, if you have realized something, then you can describe it. And you can, you know, impart it to others. You can share it with others. So that is the secret in the process. That one should take to you know, uh, surrender to a spiritual master and accept his guidance and serve him nicely. And then uh, ask the questions in a submissive manner. Shishi Gauranitai Ki Jai. Shri Shri Radha Madan Mohan Ki Jai. Shri Shri Sita Ram Lakshmi Hanuman Ki Jai. Shila Prabhupada Ki Janand Kori Vaishnavind Ki Jai. Hare Krishna. So now the topic comes that of a spiritual master. And how should one regard the spiritual master is given next? that the spiritual master should be considered to be directly the Supreme Lord. Because, now this is very, you know, Srila Prabhupada is providing this translation for the verse 26, that the spiritual master should be considered to be directly the Supreme Lord because he gives transcendental knowledge for enlightenment. Else his enlightenment and his Vedic studies and knowledge, now this is to the disciple, that the disciples' enlightenment and his Vedic studies and knowledge are like the bathing of an elephant. And what's the bathing of an elephant? 
Elephant goes in the waters, cleans itself nicely, comes out, and the next activity it does it picks up dirt and pull, you know, scatters that on its body. So bathing of an element, so you don't want that because it becomes impure right there, right after having taken the bath. And when, now, while the behavior of a disciple is how he should treat, and also how sakshad dhari tvena samastha shastha yuttas tatha bhagavati vasadbhi. So Lord Shri Krishna in the Shiksha uh, in the Guru Ashtakam, we saying that, you know, a spiritual master, all the scriptures are identifying that the scripture master should be treated just like the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Why? Because he is very dear to the Lord. Kintu Prabhu Yaha Priya Tasya. Because the spiritual master is very dear to the Lord, Lord Shri Krishna. So that's why he should be worshipped in this manner. And now most of the time the spiritual master is in sannyas order. So the next, you know, one of the verses, Devashinarat continues to identify how sannyasi should be. He says, one who accepts the sannyas order gives up three principles of materialistic activities in, in which one indulges in the field of household life. So again, sannyasis, they give up three activities. So, you know, in household life, a grahastha is engaged in dharm, earth, kaam, moksha. Dharm is religiosity. Earth is economic development. Kaam is sense gratification. Of course, regulated sense gratification in this case. And moksha is seeking liberation. So, dharm, earth, kaam, moksha. Religiosity, economic development, sense gratification and liberation. So, sannyasis gives up three of those which are religion, economic development, and sense gratification. And after taking sannyas, however, if one returns to grahastha life, he is called a vantashi. Vantashi means one who eats his own vomit. He is indeed shameless. So this is, you know, Devishi Narad is identifying to Yudhishthi Maharaj and Srila Prabhupada translating it. So in verse 38 and 39, the different behavior of different folks in different ashramas, the spiritual classes is described. So it is describing in the translation it's given. It is abominable for a person living in the Grahast ashram to give up the regulative principles. So in the Ghast Ashram, one should not give up the regulative principles. And there are four regulative principles. They are no meat eating, no illicit sex, no intoxication, and no gambling. So we follow those four principles. And of course, fifth one is chanting of Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. And also the count is given that minimum 16 rounds should be chanted. And on days, uh, days like Ekadashi and special you know, festival days, minimum of 25 rounds should be chanted of Mahamantra on Tulsi beads. Now, for Brahmachari, not to follow the Brahmachari vows while living under the care of a Guru. So Brahmachari should follow their Brahmachari vows which is, you know, studying the Vedic literature, not being attracted by the opposite sex, and so forth. So they also follow those regulations. And one of, for a vanaprastha to live in a village, or in a city, means in this particular case, to, you know, between, you know, among people, and engage in so-called social activities. Or for a sannyasi to be addicted to sense gratification. Because sannyasis, they are only engaged in the activities of liberation, bhakti yoga, jnana yoga, and so forth. Now, with respect to this, you know, with the disease, there is always a treatment that follows. So one who acts in this way is to be considered the lowest renegade. So it's not just for one category, it's identified for all four. But then if one does make a mistake, you should always correct it. You know, you should always seek to introspect and retrospect and correct your mistakes. It's not that when you fall down, you are fallen. Uh, inability to get up is fallen. That you cannot 
make improvement in your life to go at a higher platform than where you are. So if someone continues to be in this manner, you know, not follow their woes and their regulatory principles, you know, such a pretender is bewildered by the external energy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Because when we are engaged in sense gratification, you know, material energy, you are actually in her clutches. You know, the three gunas, mode of goodness, passion, ignorance, gunas also means ropes. So you are bound by the ropes, you are, you know, you are chained. <laughs> and that's not going to help you. And one should either reject him from any position or take compassion, of taking compassion upon him, teach him, if possible, to resume his original position. Now, if you're given a choice, like if you are in that state, like you have made a mistake and you're fallen, who would you appreciate more? One who completely rejects you and you know, blasphemes you for that activity, or another person who comes and gives you a helping hand to help you get up? Which one is higher? Helping hand, right? Because he's compassionate. And Vaishnavas means they are known to be compassionate. Not the other kind. Means materialists mostly take this, oh, he's a bad person. They just label you. While, you know, this is not, don't hate the, the you know, person who is sick. Hate the sickness in this particular case. Hate the disease, not the diseased person. So in this particular case, Vaishnavas, they go forward and try to help you know, others get to a higher position. Yet at the same time, you have to be aware that for the four spiritual classes, one should be at a higher class to be able to help others. Like if a sannyasi falls down from the position, he should be supported by other sannyasi to regain and come back to his order. And similarly, if, you know, a grahastha falls down, he should be helped by, you know, a grahastha or a vanaprastha or sannyasi, people on a higher level of, you know, spiritual classes. That should happen. Now, as this is being described, like how people should be advancing, you know, in 41 and 42, a very nice analogy is given. How this body that we receive in human, for human beings is to be, you know, in an analogical manner. How do you achieve your goal? It is described that transcendentalists who are advanced in knowledge Compare the body to be a chariot, right? So, Ganis and transcendentalists, as you are getting the instructions from Vedic literature, you are saying that this body is a chariot. And this bo when a chariot is there, of course, you have horses that are pulling the chariot. So, what are the horses? They are the senses. And they are seeking different sense objects as their destinations, right? Your nose wants to smell something, you know, very nice. Your hands want to touch something very soft and silky. Your eyes want to see, you know, beauty. So that's how our senses are constantly. Your ears want to hear sweet words, mostly your own praises, <laughs> right? <laughs> you feel happy when somebody praises you. You know, they, they're singing your praises and you're very happy. So, you know, that's how materialist views. But then, you know, Amrish Maharaj teaches us. He uses his body, his legs to walk to the temple, you know, the sense of touch, to touch the Vaishnavas, to bow down in front of the deities, to sense of smell, to smell the flowers and tulsi leaves that have been offered to the Lordship, to see the beautiful form of the Lord, you know, he engages his eyes, his ears to hear the Vedic instructions. So that's how it actually purifies the senses and gets us to understand the purpose of life. So these horses are like senses. So they need to be controlled. And to control them, the reins are the mind. The transcendentalists consider the reins to be the mind. So when you have reins, somebody should be the charioteer for this chariot, right? Holding the reins to give it the direction. And that's intelligence. So mind is actually considered below intelligence, but then people are driven by mind because it becomes too powerful. So with intelligence, and now, the person in the bodily concept of life, that is the owner sitting on this chariot. So there is a driver, then there is a passenger also. And that's in the bodily concept of life. And the consciousness is the bondage in this material world. 
that you're conscious about things around you and how you want to kind of like, you know, use them for your own purpose sometimes. And that's your bondage, your bound. You're interacting with different sense objects that is there. However, a transcendentalist is looking at the pranam mantra as the bow, right? So you think of Arjun, you know, how he's using the bow. So when there is a bow, there has to be arrow, right? Bow on its own won't do anything. So the living entity, the spiritual spark itself, is the arrow, the pure living entity. Himself is the arrow. And the target is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So a living entity wants to get to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. It's such a beautiful analogy given. And now, the different paths people take, right? Once they understand, you know, from the transcendentalist perspective, they engage in different activities. We're always kind of trying to improve our economic conditions. And at the same time, we are trying to make spiritual progress. So there are two marks. One is Pravitti Marg, and the second one is Nivritti Marg. So Pravitti Marg is Pravitti activities. They involve rising oneself from a lower to a higher condition of materialistic life. The economical conditions improve. But does that mean, you know, if somebody dresses very nicely, he goes to a shop, not in very nicely dressed, buys a nice piece of clothes, and then wears those clothes. Has the person really become more intelligent? Has he made spiritual advancement? Is he looking more attractive than before? Yes. <laughs> Again, just assume that he has got the best possible clothes, like, you know, and he's got, and he went, or she went even to a parlor and completely transformed her, you know, makeover. <laughs> now, all of a sudden, internally, there is no transformation, but externally, there is transformation. So that is Pravitti Marg. People are just trying to have a great lifestyle, but not a great life. <laughs> Inside, they're miserable. You know, they are still, you know, they are not uh, interested that so many people are liking me. They are interested that one person is not liking me at times. You know, those kind of situations arise. Now, what is Nivritti Marg? Nivritti activities are the ones where one is purified and becomes fit to enjoy eternal, blissful life. Now, that is Nivritti Marg. Just by engaging in devotional service, the devotee feels purification, feels happiness, feels bliss. And of course, to feel all that means there's a peace formula. How can someone be happy without being peaceful? Is it possible for you to be disturbed and yet be happy? No. So first, you have to be at peace. And even the peace formula is given in Bhagavad Gita, 6th chapter, the last verse, 34th verse. Bhuktaram yagya tapasam sarva loka maheshwaram Suruhidam sarva bhuta nam gyatma mam shantim richati. So there are only three factors one has to know. Bhoktaram yagitap sam. So who's the you know, final enjoyer of all the sacrifices, all the oblations that are being given? Lord Krishna. He's saying, I am the enjoyer. Yagya Purusha. Yagya Purusha is Krishna himself. Right? And when you make an oblation in the fire, you say the you end the mantra with the word swaha. Who knows the meaning of swaha? Swaha means actually Yagya Purusha's wife. Her name is Swaha. So when you approach father, you approach through mother. Right? It's easy to approach through mother because mother is already in love. You know, she loves you. And when she presents your case, father has to agree. <laughs> right? <laughs> father has to agree because mother is saying, you have to give this to my son. So when we make oblations to the fire, it's going to Yagya Purusha, who is Lord Krishna himself, and you are going, giving it through Mother Swaha, and she gives it to Yagya Purusha. Bhuktaram Yagya Tapsam, Sarva Loka Maheshwaram. So I am the proprietor of all that can be, material universes, spiritual universes, everything that you see. I am the supreme proprietor. Right? And Suruhidam Sarva Bhutanam. I am the best friend of every living entity. Suruhidam, you know, best friend. Sarva, every Bhutanam, living entity. Whether it be human beings, animals, birds, insects, aquatics, everyone. 
trees, plants, everything. So one who knows this, Gyatwa Maam Shantim Richati. Whoever knows me, Gyatwa Maam, knows me as such, Shantim Richati. You know, attains peace. So what are the three things? He is the Yagya Purusha, the proprietor of everything, and the best friend. Simply, with those three factors. Now, as this description is going on with Devashi Narad enlightening to Yudhishthi Maharaj, so Devashi Narad is, you know, instructing Yudhishthi Maharaj on how to have an ideal family life. And this chapter, uh, instructions for a civilized human being. He is describing further. There are different type of oneness that's being described, and it's very interesting. You know, uh, oneness is very much common between impersonalist, you know, they always want to merge into Brahman. And there's a very nice joke also in this regard. Once an impersonalist, a Brahmanwadi, he goes to, an impersonalist goes to a sandwich shop and asks the shopkeeper to make him one with all. Get it? To make him one with all. <laughs> so, you know, it's not that busy, it's a subtle one, you know. So yeah, <laughs> just if you can get it. So again, now Devashi Nara, he's doing to talk about three types of oneness. He's talking about Bhava. No, actually, this is uh Srila Prabhupada, he describes in his purport the three words Bhava Advaita, Kriya Advaita, and Dravya Advaita. So what are these? So when one understands, so in verse 63, Devashinaya is providing this information, when one understands that the result and cause are one, and that duality is ultimately unreal, like the idea that the threads of a cloth are different from the cloth itself, one reaches the conception of oneness, called Bhava Advaita. We understand that threads are different than the cloth itself. And together they are constituting and creating the image of a cloth. Then in verse 64, he describes, My dear Yudhishthir Partha, when all the activities one performs with his mind, body, and words are dedicated directly to the service of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, one reaches oneness of activities, or Kriya Advaita. So mind, body, and words, when one is serving the Supreme Personality of Godhead, so devotees are constantly serving the Lord, so they are at the level of Kriya Advaita. And when one, the, you know, the ultimate goal, and we talked about that pranava, mantra is the bow, the living entity, the, you know, as the arrow, <coughs> looking at its destination to reach, which is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the lotus feet of Supreme Personality of Godhead. When the ultimate goal and interest of one's self, one's wife, one's children, one's relatives, and all other embodied living entities is one. This is called Dravya Advaita, or oneness of interest. Now this is very interesting, that oneness of interest comes here, where Devashi Narad, in the following verses, encourages Yudhishthi Maharaj. He says that you are very lucky. So Yudhishthi Maharaj started with, you know, a Mura uh, Grahastha is not a very intelligent Grahastha who does not know the goal of life. How should they approach the goal of life? So that is being described. So again, he's saying that you don't have to worry. You and other Pandavas, you all brothers, are the pure devotees of the Lord. So much so that the Lord resides with you at your home. And all the transcendentalists, they visit your palace just to be able to see the Lord. So he is identifying that Yudhishthi Maharaj has the third level, oneness of interest, because they are actually helping Lord Shri Krishna in Lord Shri Krishna, Vasudeva Krishna's mission, which is to remove the burden of the earth. So that is going on. And in translation, oh, and then in the purport, Srila Prabhupada, he describes a very famous verse from the 10th canto, where you know, after Brahma Vimohana Leela, Lord Brahma sings prayers to Lord Shri Krishna. There's a beautiful verse, the 50th verse. 
समाश्रिता पद पल्लव प्लवम महत पदम पुनि यशो मुरारे भवाम भुरी वत्स पदम परम पदम 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 यत विपदाम न तेषाम नवट इज दैट मीन समाश्रिता ये पद पल्लव प्लवम सो दोज हु हैव एक्सेप्टेड द लोटस फीट ऑफ द लॉर्ड पद पल्लव पल्लव इज द लोटस बर्ड यू नो द बर्ड ऑफ लोटस बर्ड एंड प्लवम इज द परफेक्ट बोट महत पदम पुनि यशो मुरारे महत पदम who is the shelter of the cosmic manifestation so in his lotus feet you know cosmic manifestation is coming from him he is the original uh, creator and he is also known as murari the enemy of the mura demon bhavam budhir so this material world is an ocean of nescence you know it becomes what what's a padam it becomes as small as a half calf a uh, hoof print so calf is a baby cow right or baby bull so calf's hoof print child of a calf and their goal is param padam their goal is the ultimate goal param padam and not the world which where there is danger at every step padam padam yat vipadam na tesham vipada is there is danger at every step so such is the goal of such transcendentalist and when devashi nara is describing you know how yudhishthir maharaj is so lucky to have and he is in a perfect state he goes and describes his past because in the very first canto he had described that he was in his previous life son of a maid servant and how he had served the vaishnavas and thus he had attained the knowledge and how he actually received his transcendental body but he goes further back he said prior to being the son of a maid servant i was actually a gandharva and his name as a gandharva was upabarhana so upabarhana was a very attractive gandharva he had very beautiful face very attractive features and he was very famous among the residents of gandharva loka so gandharva loka high planetary system and he because of being attracted by the opposite sex he was, was always having this lusty desires so once gandharvas they were invited by the demigods on a festival and at the festival they were singing and apsaras were dancing and he was surrounded upabarhana he was surrounded by attractive women and he started singing at that time and what was he singing he was singing the glories of the demigods and so the prajapatis who were the organizers you know the high demigods they became upset with him they said you are singing we are you know seeking this festival to sing the glories of the supreme lord and you are singing the glories of a demigod all these demigods so they became upset and they cursed him that you become first of all a shudra because you are acting in ignorance and shudra means one who is in ignorance and that you lose your beauty you become ugly because you, he was very proud of his beauty so that's why you know uh, from the gandharva's position devashi nara means he fell down and in his next birth he becomes the son of a maid servant however during chaturmasya when some vedantis were visiting at that time he served them very nicely and he ate their remnants and he listened to them attentively and just by listening to him his heart purified and after his mother's death he went out you know seeking and he was traveling different places and finally he started meditating on the supreme personality of godhead you know smaranam is also one of the devotional service the processes one of the processes and uh, the lord appeared at the lotus of his heart and suddenly he disappeared and you know imagine you have the biggest diamond in your hand and all of a sudden it vanishes you want to you know that you possessed it even for a moment you want to get it again right so he was trying to get again lord appear in his lotus heart he was again trying to meditate with more austerity more strongly but it was not happening and then he heard the voice your lord is telling him that actually i appeared just to you know you know invoke your interest so you will not be because you are not pure at heart 
at this stage, you'll not be able to see me again. But by engaging in my devotional service, you can attain transcendental position. And similarly, like thunder and lightning appears at the same time, at the time of his death, suddenly, just like a thunder, you know, thunder is very, you know, it has like a shocking effect on you. So that's like thunder. The death is like thunder. But immediately, right after that was lightning where he received the transcendental body and appeared as the son of Lord Brahma. You know, the topmost creator in this uh, living entity in this material universe. So after saying that, he is basically, you know, he, Lord Krishna is worshipped and then Devashi Narada is worshipped and then Devashi Narada returns back home. And the, all this narration between Devashi Narad and uh, Yudhishthira Maharaj was later described, you know, in Srimad Bhagavatam, by Shukdev Goswami to Parikshit Maharaj, which was later recited by Sutta Goswami at Namasharanya to the thousand sages. So this is where this chapter ends. Where he says that, uh, uh, you know, this is where Shukdev Goswami is saying that, uh, on the planet within this universe, the varieties of living entities, moving and non-moving, including the demigods, demons, and human beings, were all generated from the daughters of Maharaj Daksha. I have now described them and their different dynasties. So this narration ends, uh, seventh canto ends with this chapter, and eighth canto would start, starting next week. So in this chapter, 16 wonderful points are being discussed as how you know, we should take to the instructions of civilized human beings. Uncivilized human beings means people who are even fallen down from the four social classes and the spiritual classes. So we should take to these instructions and the instructions start with, you know, first trying to control our mind and try to seek the shelter of Lord Shri Krishna, which is chanting of the holy name. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare, and following the processes and the regulative principles and instructions that apply to each of the spiritual classes, each of the different ashramas. Hare Krishna. Kantra Shimad Bhagavatam ki jai, Shila Prabhupad ki jai, Anand Kori Vaishnavindi ki jai. Any questions or comments? Hari Bol. Shila Prabhupad ki jai. Shri Radha Madan Mohan Ki Jai Shri Shri Sita Ram Lakshman Hanuman Ki Jai Shri Shri Gauranitai Ki Jai <laughs>